Welcome back, everybody, to In The Loop. Welcome back to In The Loop. My name is Katie Kenlaw, and in today's episode, we need to talk online. We're going to be covering social media marketing logistics. When to post, what to post, how often. So today I'm joined by Evelyn Setzer and Emily Copeland from The Smithy Group. This episode is brought to you by Punchmark, the jewelry industry leading website provider. Join the community of nearly 500 other jewelry stores in choosing Punchmark's easy to use e-commerce platform. Go to punchmark.com today for your free demo. This episode is also brought to you by The Smithy Group, a digital growth agency that helps leaders and businesses dream bigger and achieve multi-generational integrity. Through insights and intelligence, digital marketing and advertising solutions, they help businesses expand their business and grow their revenue. Smithy Group has helped hundreds of businesses surpass their goals and believe that whatever your business, whatever your story, they make it matter to your audience. A special thank you to Podium for sponsoring today's episode. In the Loop is going to be giving away a pair of Apple AirPod Pros, and you can be entered in to win these AirPods by leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, following at the Smithy Group and Punchmark websites on Instagram, and DMing a screenshot of your review to the Smithy Group. You can learn more about this giveaway by going to punchmark.com slash loop dash giveaway, and these reviews really help us grow, so thank you very much in advance. Thanks, everybody. So, welcome back to In The Loop. Uh, again, my name is Katie Kinlaw, and I will be your host again today. Um, Mike Burpo is taking uh, a little bit of a leave of absence. Not really. He's just passing the reins on to me. So, we're going to be talking today about exactly that talking. We need to talk. We need to talk about what's going on online. So we're going to go over more specifics in regards to logistics, right? When to post, what to post, how often, get into the nitty gritty piece of things as well. I am joined again today by our friends, Evelyn Setzer and Emily Copen from the Smithy Group. So hi guys, how's it going? Hey Katie, we're excited to be back. Yeah. Rocking and rolling. Excited for you guys to be back too. We had such a good time last episode talking more specifically around like our top jewelry accounts and things that we really love to see in terms of the types of content. So today I wanted to talk more specifically around logistics. So talking about best practices, I think that this is something that um, most of the clients that I've talked to in the jewelry industry are kind of stumped on, right? You know, what days a week do I post? How often do I post? What does that consistency look like? And I think even breaking it down even further between channels, right? Breaking it down by what does that post schedule look like for Facebook? What does it look like for Instagram? So I'd like to leave the floor open and kind of get some initial thoughts from you guys in terms of the difference, I think, number one, about posting schedule from Facebook and Instagram. Should it be the same? Should it be different? Thoughts and feedback there. Yeah, I think that on Facebook, you have a different opportunity since it's not image driven like Instagram. Instagram, you always have to think, how does this creative and copy interact? And how does it pair? And then how does it contribute to the whole? Facebook, there's no grid view. You don't go back to a feed and see something that almost looks like a website, right? And have this immense pressure of making it fit the feed. So I think with Facebook, there's more opportunity to be even more casual post, even maybe more often. Like if you find a link to an event happening in your local area that, you know, your followers would think is interesting, share it. If you, someone tags you, reshare it. You have just way more shareability, I feel, on Facebook, especially with links, since you don't have to be stuck to your link in bio. It's just much easier to post about your blogs maybe three or four more times than you would on Instagram or direct to something on your website that maybe you wouldn't on Instagram as much. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that we can get really, really hung up on making sure that we're posting the right stuff at the right time. And and that can cause a lot of undue stress that we really don't need to have. I think that um, just like Evelyn said, that on Facebook, that's such a great place to 
post often, to share, to interact. That's a little bit more personal on the side of, you know, being able to share more. Whereas Instagram, I mean, it's also equally as important to interact. But um, I think there's always the the rule that posting in the, you know, in the morning and then the evening are really the best times to post. Instagram does give us the insights um, opportunity to be able to see when our followers and when our audience is most active and when they are seeing our, our stuff. But I also think that you have to look at your own audience and understand and see the rhythm that already exists there and when your people are on. So if you know that uh, most of your clients are women, uh, maybe middle-aged women who spend time in the evenings when they're home or when they're sitting down, you can kind of just play into that. But it does take a little bit of experimenting and just trying to see, uh, you know, when do you get the most reaction and kind of playing around with it. But again, I don't think it's something that you need to really, really stress about. It's something that you get to experiment with as you go, both on Facebook and Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's really helpful too, because there's a lot of confusion in terms of like, or do I post them at the same time? Do I just share the same post through like both platforms and that's like sufficient? Um, so I think making sure that you have that distinction in terms of Instagram is a little bit more curated and Facebook, you have a little bit more freedom, you can share more content, um, maybe more specific links you'd mentioned to uh, blog posts and kind of highlighting things just a little bit differently. And your demographic is probably going to be a little bit different too than like what's on Facebook versus what's on Instagram. So that's also something to keep in mind that, um, you know, looking at those demographic reports that you have at your fingertips, seeing, you know, what types of people are engaging on both platforms, I think will kind of help give you a little bit of an edge as you're planning out um, what to post and to when and on what platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Jumping in here. I do agree that as a good place to start, we do coach people to post like the same thing, both on Facebook and Instagram, just to start building that repertoire of content and start building that expectation. And something we really harp on here at TSG is that you teach your audience how to interact with you and you build that customer expectation with every post that you make. So if you have a blog that comes out, if you just know, okay, we're going to post about this blog three or four times over the next two weeks so that it gets the right airtime and make that standard, people will just start to build that into their expectations subconsciously. And so it's not always helpful to compare yourself to other profiles. So I hope if anyone's listening, they're encouraged. Like it's not always helpful to look at other people's Instagrams and dissect hour by hour how often they're posting because right, they've built that audience to expect that. So you can teach people how to treat your brand by being more consistent. Um, and something that we talked about in an earlier episode last season was like if you're posting in real time, you know, every single day as often as you can, the chances are you're wasting time. Like there's a, there's a system that you can build using a scheduling platform like later.com, which I'm obsessed with, or, um, there's, there's so many out there, but that one is one of my favorites. And it just makes it so much easier to even get those insights that Emily was mentioning. So you're not digging on the back end of your business profile on Instagram. It's all just right there in an application breaking down for you, what top cities your customers are in, or your viewers are in, or what hours they'll even give you a slot on when you're scheduling where to drop that post so you can see the best time of day. So it, it might be the morning or night, but it might be surprising. You might be four o'clock or like three o'clock and you're like, I don't know why, but it is what it is. And you just kind of cater to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I think that that's really interesting to keep in mind when we're talking about uh, like making sure that you're fine tuning it for your audience. But I think kind of taking it a little bit of a step back. So that's more specifically in regards to when to post. We haven't really talked about how often, and I know that that's going to be probably tailored to the individual company based on their bandwidth, based on, you know, um, their resources that they have, but as just like a super blanket level, um, response, what would you say in terms of consistency? Is it once a day? Is it twice a day? Is it two times a week? Probably not. You want more consistency than that. Um, what are your thoughts on feedback in terms of consistency of posting? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say this, I would post as often as you know that you can be available to respond to people when they're commenting and interacting. So if you can't be there to be able to interact with your audience as they are responding to your photo, to your information that you've just posted, then I would say I would hold off until you have a few moments because that interaction when you're posting, the worst thing that you can do is post and run. 
because people are there to see it and interact with you. And they probably, if they have questions, you need to be there to respond back. The algorithm loves it when you are interacting with the people that are commenting or liking uh, that just builds momentum for that post and to get that post in front of more eyeballs. And so I would say, yes, once a day, we encourage our clients to post once a day, five days a week, six days a week for some but it's also even more important to post when you know that you can be around and hang around and, and respond. Yeah. I've actually, even on that point, I've recommended to brands to go down to three posts a week if they're not going to be able to give it the proper breadth of time to, like Emily is saying, that first comment, if you respond back to it, the chances of that post moving higher in someone's newsfeed is really high. And it's about making the algorithm work for you. So to back it up even further, just like how the algorithm works, like we've done so much research, because this is a moving target. So if you heard us on an earlier episode, say, Oh, you're three to five times a week, and maybe a few stories, and you're good, like, the game is changing constantly. And the good news, though, is that Instagram is rewarding human like behavior. It wants to know who you know and who you're interacting with and start building these spheres of communication on your profile. So the more that your profile interacts with people, the more likely your content is to be seen by those people and then also by prospective audiences. So I would say just as important as to post, it's just as important to, as Emily and I've talked about recently, is like warm up your account before you post. Like go watch a bunch of stories, put your phone next to you and just start swiping and and interact with your customers and your audience in a way that's very human and normal, just like you would in your feed. So that's just as important, if not more important than how often you post is the community engagement piece. It's like the ghost in the background that people don't talk about. (laughs) That's right. Yeah. Yeah, we did. We talked about this idea that it really is important the first 20 minutes before you post, if you can, just like Evelyn said, get in there, start interacting. And what that looks like is, again, watching stories, liking photos, going back to previous things that you've posted and responding to any comments or, you know, even going in and and seeing if you have new followers, going in and following them, commenting on theirs, interacting. I mean, Instagram specifically is no longer a place to simply advertise. It's it's really a place that you have to, you're building into a community. You're treating it as if these people are walking into the door of your store physically. And how would you interact with them? How would you treat them? And we've got to look at Instagram and social media as a platform that that's also happening there. That those people, even though we can't see their faces, that they're it's just as important as if they're walking in the store. So again, can't post and run, you need to stick around, but also try and show up a little early, like showing up early for a meeting and get on there and start interacting and warm up the algorithm so that when you post, it pushes your your post up to the top in front of more people than it would if you didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important to talk about algorithm because usually people are asking, how often do I need to post in order to make a difference? That's like the second part of the question, right? How often do I need to post in order to have an impact as a brand or to gain more followers or to sell more jewelry. And the number isn't the problem. It's the everything around that. What is your caption? How is your profile interacting? Are you building, are you building an audience or like Emily's saying, are you posting and running? So I think it's just important to talk about the algorithm when you talk about posting too. Right. I think that that's so interesting too. You know, from my perspective, uh, you know, in my own professional life, I typically focus more on the paid social aspect of things and not as aggressively on the organic side. So it's so interesting for me to get that feedback. You would never think of sitting down and like engaging as a business and like actually looking at posts and, you know, focusing more specifically on the algorithm from an organic standpoint on Instagram is just as important when we talk about tailoring to the algorithm for search engine optimization. You know what I mean? It's it's a living and breathing thing. And unfortunately, the name of the game is also playing into that too. So I think that's such great feedback to give people that it's not just about posting, it's about acting as a whole. So that's so important. Yes. Yeah. And in our research too, just to add this, that we found that almost 85% of people who are, are looking to buy jewelry or whatever it is, they do go to Instagram first to look at the product before they'll go to a website. So as business owners to understand the magnitude of that amount of people are going to Instagram first to just see, hey, what is this product all about? Or what what do they have posted that I can see from more of a personal perspective of, you know, of Instagram, of social media before they would type in a website. 
if we can understand that and that amount of people are doing that first, then that really changes the game for how we treat social media. That again, it's just not, it's not a place to just simply post and hope that people like what they see, but it's a place to interact with them ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's so insightful too about, you know, looking at it as you're curating, you know, that audience and you're also curating that credibility and that trust. And ultimately at the end of the day, you need to have both of those things. You have to have an audience and you have to have trust with them to be successful as a business. So I think that that's all very insightful. For sure. Okay, everybody, let's take a moment to hear a quick word from our sponsor, Podium. Our clients know that it doesn't matter how great your website is if people can't find it. Podium helps you get found and chosen by making it easy to get reviews from your happiest customers just by sending a simple review request through text. In fact, with Podium, every step of your customer journey is powered by text messaging, so you can talk to your customers on the channels they prefer. Start the conversation on your website with Podium Web Chat. Set appointments, answer questions, and close deals all in the same thread. When it's time to pay, just send a request over text so your customers can pay in seconds. And now that you've got a happy customer, send them a review invite over text too so you can rise up the local rankings and start the cycle all over again. With all this, plus powerful integrations and features in one consolidated inbox, Podium is your tool for customer communication. Send a text, get more done. Punchmark clients will receive 25% off when they sign up for Podium. Learn more at podium.com slash punchmark. Thanks. Back to the show. So welcome back to In The Loop. I want to kind of shift a little bit when we're talking about, you know, like when to post, how often, kind of some best practices around that, but shifting a little bit in more of the engaging, more like specific logistics in terms of like who specifically to tag and post different hashtags. Talk to me a little bit about what you feel like makes the most sense for people. Like if a jewelry store, for example, posts a specific product or a model wearing a specific piece, how would you coach them in terms of who to tag and what hashtag you should use? Do they tag the brand? Do they tag themselves? Like give me some insights in terms of some helpful tidbits there. Gosh, there's so many things to say. Yeah, I was just going to jump in and say to just be careful and understand the balance too. Like if you're tagging, if you're a retailer and you're tagging the brands that your store carries and you're building a relationship with those brands before your store, right? So it's just positioning and making sure that that the language is always around. You know, we love carrying this brand because they value this and so do we and we curate you know, the best of the Vahan collection and Gabriel and Co. If you're going to talk about brands, make sure it fits underneath your umbrella of your brand, your store. So don't just go out and post branded assets of other, you know, other brands and then tag them and give them all the airtime, like make sure that they fit your brand. So we wouldn't even recommend using branded assets. Sometimes they're really powerful, but take your own content and tag them. And then you know, if you tag Vahan and then they repost your story of you wearing that jewelry and you styling that jewelry, that's more eyeballs on your profile. So just thinking about the relationship between you and brands is something that we really care about at TSG is, of course, you know, give credit, give honor, and, but at the same time, make sure that it's catering to your audience and building a relationship with your store first. Like, why should they shop with you before buying that brand at another store. So that's really important. But then also with hashtags, like we think it's really important to build branded hashtags and make sure that you have a store hashtag that you're using in every single post. Or if you have a specific rhythm where you're posting couple photos, because we love couple photos, you know, do you have a hashtag for your store name, couple or bridal at blah, 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 or love in this area, things like that. So that there's a, a suite of content whenever you go to that hashtag and see all the couples that are there. And then another little tidbit, I was on TikTok recently and I learned a really awesome tip about hashtagging your local area, like your store or or town that you're in and hashtagging that in your stories and then hiding that hashtag like underneath the picture because it'll then be geotagged in or not just the hashtag, but you could also like geotag too, but you could hashtag and geotag in your stories and then it'll pop up in like the discover whatever it is for that location. And I just think it's like, awesome cheat for getting more eyeballs on your content. So those are just three rapid fire tips. But (laughs) I was like, that's a really smart to like hide things in your your stories so that they get seen by more people. Absolutely. 
One tidbit that I'll share real quick. Um, no, I just think that the more people that you can tag in a post and it makes sense to tag them, the better. I mean, that's more eyeballs, that's more accounts, that's connecting more, Your the web is going out. Um, and so if you can add more people and tag them, I, I think the better. Yeah, that's so clever too. TikTok is so funny. People make fun of it. Um, well, maybe not make fun of it. I think people are a little skeptical on TikTok as a platform, but there's some interesting there's some interesting stuff on there. Even more specifically around like small businesses and growing businesses, you know. So it, it's worth um, you know kind of looking and getting some more um, tidbits and information there. I think that's so interesting too. So we've talked about uh, like tagging specific people. We've talked about hashtags more specifically. Let's kind of shift a little bit. We talked very briefly in this past episode around type of captions. Talk to me about what you feel like is the most effective around like call to actions for specific posts. I think not only for social organic posts, like in the actual feed, but even like call to actions that you can utilize within your Instagram stories, kind of the break down between utilizing that for kind of both of those platforms too. Yeah, I think the call to action is one of the most important things that you can do. And you it can vary de- depending on the post, but also really what you want them to do. And I feel like there's been more calls to action that have come as we've gone. So basically what I'm trying to say is like now we can say things like, save this post and come into the store and show us this piece of jewelry that you found on our feed that you love so much so that you don't have to go searching for it or walk into a store and try and describe it to the retail, to the salesperson. Uh, but you can actually just show them you've saved it. So that's something that I try to encourage as a call to action on a lot of the posts. You can, as a call to action, ask that person to DM the account. Hey, send us a direct message. Ask us about this. What questions do you have? Um, you know, how can we um, answer anything that you, you may want to know about this piece or about our store? So there's specific calls to action that, that are important. I think you can do a simple call to action as a poll, even on a story. You know, hey, interact with us. Tell us what you think. What do you like? Do you like this one better? You know, how much do you love this necklace or things like that that just just allow and ask and invite that interaction that is really key and so important for anybody who has a business on Instagram. Yeah, there's a trend going around with show us a picture of and then people can fill in the blank and the sticker on their story. I think jewelers should do it. Like, I think I've seen influencers doing it, like show us a picture of your last vacation. It's basically what people are doing in quarantine to stay entertained and look at some old photos. Mm-hmm. But I think jewelry stores should do it. Like show us a picture of your, your biggest diamond or your most recent custom design. I think that would be super fun. And, you know, salespeople, you can plant some answers. You can answer some of the, the stickers and get it started. So it made it seem like hundreds of people submitted what they wanted to see. Come on, have a little bit of fun with it. So I think playing with stickers is super important. But I also think that we can be creative about some of the standard, you know, like and and save. So you can say double tap if you agree or give a double tap if you want to congratulate this couple, you know, as a symbol of clapping or congratulating or, you know, save this post when you're ready to pop the question or share this post for a chance to win some giveaway. There's just ways that you can take the action and plant it within your caption to make it feel more natural versus like, please like our post or, or comment, what, comment what you think or tell us a story about XYZ. I know that for Valentine's Day, people are really willing to share their love stories or something. I know that's already passed, but just thinking about opportunities for right. people to, to talk with your brand and have a place on your feed for them to feel heard. And again, like we've already said, make sure you interact back with it. Don't just like leave them hanging there. But yeah, I just think that calls to action are a really beautiful way to start conversations. And I think it's really important to just, again, teach people how to shop with your brand. So if you know that the ring in the picture is really expensive and they might not know exactly how to take that next step, soften that experience so they don't just go from liking to leaving How can they go from liking to asking more questions? So see something you like here. Here's all the ways you can get in contact with us. Text a real person at this phone number. I know Bremer does that for their calls to action or have, you know, a salesperson ready for them to to get in contact with via DM. So there's just so many ways for, for jewelry brands to feel more human and humanizing the call to action is a really important way to do that. 
Yeah. And I'll add one more thing onto that too. It's the simple ask for the tag. So it's having them tag their friends and people. I know for myself personally, I'm a lot of my friends will tag me in a lot of different things, whether it's a designer or clothing, you know, a piece of clothing that they know I would love or a giveaway or something like that. But I know personally, I'm exposed to a lot of brands simply because my friends tag me in things that they know I'll like. So encouraging the retailer or the brand to invite their audience to tag their friends as many times and as often as possible. I think that's a really great way because that's the personal reach. That's the, that's the friend recommending something that it, that is such a, um, I mean, there's just so much gold there in that ask and that share and tag. So as often as we can do that, that's something that we encourage too. Yeah. I love that because I think that a lot of people don't consider taking that next step, right? Um, you mentioned like humanizing that call to action. I love that turn of phrase. I'm going to keep that in my in my back pocket. I love that. Um, well, it makes sense, right? Because when I think as a business owner and maybe you're not super familiar with social media, or even if you are, you think more kind of specific and straight to the point, like I need to grow, I need to grow my followers, I need to grow my likes, but kind of taking that step further and thinking about about how can I not only use a call to action to, you know, gain those things, gain more likes, gain more followers, but also to grow that community again, focusing on building that audience, um, making that connection with your user, I think is just going to be the most effective thing for you at the end of the day. If you're using social media to do that, it's important to take that step further. Social for a reason. <laughs> social media. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Well, you know, the title of this episode was We Need to Talk, and I have to say I'm so glad that we did, uh, that we talked through all of these pieces. I think that so much good information, I think that we packed just within, you know, the time of us talking more specifically about this and kind of using all of these pieces together, you know, to be the most effective that you can be online um, is just fantastic. And thank you guys so much again for, for sitting down with me uh, and kind of running through this. This has been fantastic fun. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Appreciate it, guys. See you on the next one. Hey, thanks for listening. Leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. And remember to subscribe. It really helps us grow. Thank you so much. See you next week.